So, okay, great. In um, chapter one, we talked about Java. We got a review of that. In chapter two, we just got this very big, high-level theoretical thing about how do we analyze algorithms. And since this is a course about data structures, yay, finally, we're going to get into data structures. And we're going to be talking about the linear ones in this chapter. Um, essentially, the items are in some order depending on how they're added or removed. And one of the more useful ones is the stack, and sometimes called a pushdown stack. And what are the two ends of it called? They're usually they're called the bottom and top or the base and the top. Uh, by the way, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of drawing on the board. So this is going to be really interesting for the recording to see if this, if this all works out properly. Uh, and as the book says, it's, it's like a stack of books. Okay? Every time you get a new book, you put it on top of the stack. And then when you get take, take one off the top, also it's like cafeteria trays. Okay, you know, those, the cafeteria trays, trays that are on a spring. Has anybody ever seen those? Okay, so you push a cafeteria tray on and then you pop one off the top and the rest of them pop up for you. So if I wanted to get to the physics book in a stack, I'd have to remove the Java and calculus book here in order to get to the physics book. So here's a stack that has a number of objects, the 11, 47, 66, and 10. The bottom is at 11 and the top of the stack has a 10. Now, this is where stacks get useful. Whenever you have something that you need to have data that you have to remember, and then restore in reverse order. A stack is exactly the uh, data structure that you want. We're always going to remove things from the top. So when I remove the top object, the 10 will come off first, then the 66, then the 47, and the last will be the 11. So they'll come off in the reverse order that they were put on. Do you need me to draw a picture of this on the board? Okay, uh, let's stop sharing here. And let me, um, okay, it's not mirrored, good. So I hope this is gonna work. Chris Wandy. So here's the bottom of the stack. And let's say I put an 11 on there first. The next thing that comes on the stack is a 47. Then I put the 66 and then the 10. So those are my four entries. Now, when I, take things off the stack, I always take the top entry off first. Remember, 11 was the first thing that came in, okay? So the 10 comes off first and it goes away. Then the 66 comes off the stack. Then the 47. And the last item that goes out is the 11. So they're coming off in the reverse order that they were put in. And this is called LIFO. The last thing that goes into the stack is the first thing that goes out of the stack. And sometimes I've seen it as, which is the same thing. The first thing that goes into the stack is the last to go out. But usually we call it last in, first out. So things get reversed. Well, in this, uh, um, when you have this stack of integers, that seems sort of useless. But there are places where you a stack becomes very natural. One place where it would be, for example, is in this image editing program that I have here. I can edit um, and look at my undo history. So the first thing I did here was I flipped the image, no, I'm sorry, this stack is upside down. I loaded the base image, I resized it, changed the color levels, and then flipped the image. When I do the undo, I do them in the reverse order. So I'll first undo the flip image, then I will undo the color levels, and then I will undo the resize. And then I'm back to where I was. So whenever you have something that needs to be undone in the reverse order, like in your word processor, when you're doing undos, 
they're in the reverse order that you did them in the original. And so the people who implement the word processor, the people who implemented this image editor, what they did was they keep all the items on a stack and then they can pop things off the top of the stack and it does them in the reverse order. So you can undo in the reverse order that you did things. So um, these really are useful. So what are the operations that we're going to have on a stack? Again, this is an abstract data type. How this is going to be implemented, we're going to actually implement one later on in the chapter. We're going to have to have a constructor that can, creates a new empty stack. We have a push operator. And what push does is it puts a new item on top of the stack. Pop removes the top item from the stack. It doesn't need any parameters and it returns the item and the stack gets modified. Now, sometimes you want to see what is on the top of the stack without removing it. And that's what Pika does. It looks at it, but it does not take it off. Otherwise, every time I wanted to see what's on the top of the stack, I'd have to remove it. And if it wasn't what I wanted, I have to put it back again, which would be a waste of time. And that's why this operation is usually implemented. You also want to be able to see if the stack is empty or not. That's really useful. And it's nice to know how many items there are on the stack. So for example, if I have stack is empty, there's the contents. If I push four, then push 27. If I do a peak, I'll get the 27 back, but it will not be removed. I can push 1066 and then get the size, which is three. Is empty will be false. If I push 4711 and then pop, I get back the 4711. If I pop again, I get back the 1066 because that's what's on top of the stack. And then when I'm done, I have only two items left in the stack. So everybody okay with that? So the question is, how do we do this in Java? And the answer is because there, there is no built-in stack data type. However, we have the array list. So what we're going to do is we're going to use behind the scenes, we're going to create an array list that's going to hold the items in our stack. So now here comes our question. When I draw my stack, I'm going to implement it as an array list. And the big question is, where should the bottom of the stack go and where should the top of the stack go? We could store it with the top of the stack as the first item. Okay. Or we could also say, no, let's put this top of the stack as the last item, which would mean that we would have, and it turns out that this is the way we really want to do it. The reason is because we're always going to be adding things at the top of the stack, and we're always going to be removing things from the top, yes? Well, in an array list, adding things at the end and removing from the end is order one. But if my top was at the beginning of the array list, removing and adding from the beginning of an array list is an order n operation because I have to move everything down or push everything over to the right. So because almost all of our operations are on a stack are going to be at the end of, at the top of the stack, we want the top of the stack to be at the end of the array list when we do our implementation. Hope I'm not standing right in front of this, but we'll, we'll find out on the recording. And rather than you having you read this, I um, put it here. So we're gonna need an array list 
And we're also going to have to um, bomb out our program if there is, if we have an empty stack, if we try to pop an empty stack, there's nothing to pop, right? So we're going to um, cause an exception called no such element exception. Now we haven't talked about exceptions yet, and that's going to be a little bit later on in the course. Just take my word for it. By doing something called throw an exception, that causes your program to crash, and it will crash with this message. So we're going to have an array list of items. And notice, by the way, we're going to use generics here. Why? Because I might have a stack of integers like I had there on the board, but I could have a stack of strings. I could have a stack of doubles. I could have a stack of some sort of object. If I had, for example, a stack of circles, if it were like the circle object that we came up with a couple of weeks ago, I could have a stack of circle objects. That's why I want this to be generic. And I'm going to store them in an array list. And this is important to document where the top of the stack is. It's at the end of the array list. So to create a new empty stack, create a new array list of that given type. If the array list is empty, that means the stack is empty. Push will add to the end of the stack. And pop. Now, if the stack is empty, then I'll say there's no such element. There's nothing to pop. Otherwise, I'll remove the last item in the array list and return that to you. Peek is the same logic. If you have an empty stack, I can't peek at it because there's nothing there. I could, I could, I guess I could return null, but uh, that's a design decision. My design decision was to be to, was to be consistent between peak and pop. Yeah. And here I'm just getting the item at the end of the list. I'm not doing a remove. I'm just doing a get so that it doesn't get rid of it. And the number of items on the stack is the number of items that are in my array list. And then finally, I want a two string method. Namely, if I have an empty stack, if I don't have an empty stack, excuse me, I'll take my array list, convert it to a string, and then return a string that shows where the bottom and top of the stack are. Otherwise, if it is empty, I'll return that. So there's not a lot to implementing a stack in Java. It's fair, it is, it's, well, there's not, to, because stacks are pretty, well, they're very basic. What can I tell you? So let's look here at stacktest.java. So I'm gonna create a new stack and is empty should return true. Then I'm gonna push the words Java and keyboard. Notice this is a stack of string because it's a generic type. I can have a stack of anything I want. And then I'm going to look at what's on the top. Then I'll push computer, see the size, and print out the current stack. Then I'll push program and the current stack. Look at the top. Then I'll pop the, these two items and then find out how much is left. So let's compile that and run it. And there we have it. Is empty is true when I first do that. The top of stack will be keyboard. The size will be three. And there's Java, keyboard, and computer. Then we pushed program. And then we pop program and computer. And there's only two things left, Java and keyboard. Uh, just for fun, let's do this. Now we have an empty stack. And now let's try and pop one more time. And let's run it. 
And there's our exception. No such element stack is empty. That's what that throw did. And since I want you to have a working program, I'll comment this out. There we go. That's better. I'm going to skip this one, the basic balanced parentheses. Reason is because it turns out that the stack is overkill for the task. What they were going to do is you're going to say, okay, how can I make sure that the opening and closing parentheses match? Turns out you don't need a stack for that. All you have to do is count. Okay, so let's do something where we do have to remember things on a stack, and that's when we have balanced symbols. So, for example, I have square brackets for array lists. Curly braces are code blocks and array initializer, and parentheses are arithmetic expressions. And as long as each one of them maintains its own open and closed relationship, everything's cool. So all of these are balanced. Every opening square bracket has a closing square bracket. Every opening marker has a closing one, and they're paired up. These are not balanced. So either I can have more of one than of the other. For example, I could do something like that. Let's uh, go to liberation mono here. Where I have too many. Or I could have something like um, that, where I have too many opening and not enough closing. So that's another place that they could be unbalanced. And even if they're balanced, they have to balance correctly because that closing symbol here does not match this opening symbol there. I guess I'll put this in the notes here. Uh, too many closing. Too many opening, and we have a mismatch. So what we're going to do is we're going to do as follows. Let me stop sharing for a second here. So let's say I have parenthesis, square brackets, Brace, closing brace, square brackets, parentheses, and then another set of parentheses. And I want to check to see if that's balanced. I'm going to have a stack. Every time I see an opening marker, I'm going to push it onto the stack. This is an opener. That's an opener. When I get a closer, I look at the top of the stack. If the top of the stack is a matching one, a matching opener, then I remove it. If it's a non-matching, then I don't remove it. I, then it's an error. Now I get this thing. It's a closer. I look at the top. It's it, it matches. I have a closer. Look at the top of the stack. It matches. I remove it. Now I have an opening parenthesis and a closing parenthesis look at the top of the stack, remove it, and when I'm done, the stack had better be empty. Uh, let me do it with one that doesn't balance properly. Let's do... So here, I press to do this. I put the opening brace, and then... Here's a closing brace. I've hit the end of the string, but there's still something on the stack, which means I've got a problem. I push this. I've got a closing symbol. It matches that. I remove it. I've got this. Oops, the stack is empty. That means I have too many of these. 
So those are the situations I have to be able to look at. And also opener, push the opener. Here's a closer, um, wrong type, it's an error. So everybody okay with the idea of how this works? And the stack makes it very straightforward to do this because it remembers everything I've done. No matter how deeply I have my parentheses or braces or square brackets nested, I always remember all of them so that when I get the closures, I can make sure they're in the right order and the right type. And here's the code for it. So I'm gonna have a string that has all my opening symbols and the corresponding closing symbols. And I made a routine to just check, to check that an open symbol and a closing symbol matches. And it's gonna return a true or false. So I'm gonna return whether the index of the open symbol is the index of the closing symbol. Is everybody okay with the logic behind this? Notice, by the way, I did not need to do this. It's just a programming style thing. I didn't have to say if openers.index of open symbol is closers index of close symbol. return true else yeah but but, but but that I mean there's nothing wrong with the Java here this is exactly the same as this this is a conditional it's already true or false and that's what I'm returning a true or false so I don't have to do this comparison and then return true, the condition already is true. And I see code like this all the time. And you know, I say, oh, darn. Yeah. I decided, let, let, let's, let's cut out the middleman and do this directly. Yeah. Now I'm going to have a stack of character. Again, it has to be capital C character because remember, your generics have to be objects. So I'm using the wrapper class and that's my symbol stack. And you're gonna give me a string of symbols and I'm gonna return you a true or false, either it balances or it doesn't. So I'm going to look at the current character. If it's an opening character, I'll push it onto the stack. If it's a closing symbol, then if the stack is empty, I'll return false. That means I have too many closing and not enough openers. Correct? That was what I did on the board earlier. Otherwise, if the symbol stack is empty, then the symbol stack at the top had better match the symbol that we have here. If they don't match, I'll return false. But no matter what happens, I'm popping that symbol. I could make it a little bit more clear here. Let's do this. Let's do. Uh, so I'll pop off whatever's on this um, top of the stack. And then the top symbol had better match this symbol that you gave me in terms of the opener matching the closer. If that's not the case, I'll return false. If it's not an opener or a closing symbol, I'll skip over it. And then I return whether the symbol stack is empty or not. If it's empty, then it must have balanced. If there's anything left on the stack, that means there was an opener that didn't have a matching closer. And again, I'm because this is already a Boolean, I don't need to do an if statement. And again, I could write if sim stack dot is empty, return true, 
else return false. But again, this is already a true or false. So there's no need to go through all this rigmarole when I can just say, okay, this is the value I want to return. And then we can check the balance of these three things here. Compile it. And we should expect true and two falses. And sure enough, that's what we get. Now, what I could do, okay, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not thrilled with this, but it might help you if you're going to go and look at this code yourself later on. So I have a closing symbol without an opening symbol. And here I have... Excuse me here, I've got a, there. And then here I'm gonna unfortunately need an, an if statement. If not, sim snack dot is empty. I'm going to do a print. Now I have to do that because I'm not returning a Boolean here. I'm actually doing something with it. So if it's not empty, then um, too many opening symbols. So here I have uh, two of the two of them that are mismatched. And let's put another one here. That should be too many openers. Yeah, this is, by the way, well, notice that I'm taking the finished product here and I'm what I'm now doing is I'm restoring the kind of thing that I did while I was testing it. While I was testing it, I had all these print statements in here. And then when they were done, I removed, when I was done with it and I knew that it was working, then I removed them all. Okay, but while you're writing it, you probably want to put in some of this information here. So for example, I'm going to say, uh, I guess it could come in here. Checking balance four plus symbol string. And then here, when I'm done with this, great. Yeah. I'm I'm missing a parenthesis here. So the compiler is doing some of the sort of the, sort of the same thing that I'm doing here. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. So this this okay, th this one that I put in here for readability did not help my readability at all. So let's So I, I, again, I don't expect people who are writing a program, since I don't do it myself, I put in all these um, lines here with the system out print line, just so I can see what the heck is going on at every stage of this. And sometimes I will also put in here.
And that way, once I'm done, I can find all the debug statements by doing a search and replace really quickly. So this is just one of these techniques that I don't know. When you were doing your programming in Computer Science 75, did you often do this, putting in a lot of print lines to see what was going on? Well, I recommend it, okay? If you haven't done it before, start to try it on one or two of your programs and you'll see, wow. Oh, so that's what it's actually doing. Okay, converting decimal numbers to binary numbers. Um, a similar thing here. I'm not going to use base two because base two is boring. Are you all familiar with um, number bases other than two, other than 10? How many people need a review of number bases other than 10? Okay, real quick then, uh, let me go and uh, stop sharing here. Okay, when we have a number like 357, okay, this is the 10 to the zero column, 10 to the first, and 10 to the second. Yeah, you're familiar for this. And when you were in grade school, of course, they called this the hundreds column, the tens column, and the ones column. But since we're really sophisticated, we're going to use powers of 10. And that's going to be 3 times 10 to the second plus 5 times 10 to the first plus 7 times 10 to the zero power. Okay, you're, you're familiar with this, yes? Okay. No surprises here. Now, here's the question. What would happen if we lost our thumbs and we had only our eight fingers left? Now, instead of being able to count to 10 on our hands, we would have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then that's eight possible numbers, right? Uh-oh, we're out of fingers. So now we're going to have to go to one set of eight and no one, ones. One set of eight and one one. Are you with me on that? Okay, think of it this way. Remember how we have had 10 to the zero and 10 to the first because there's 10 possible digits, zero through nine. In base eight, we have eight to the zero, which is the ones column. Eight to the first, eight squared, and eight cubed. So when I have a number like three, seven in base eight, that's three times eight plus seven, which is 31 in base 10. Okay, I, this, is a, this is one of the geekiest jokes I know. So I, I got to tell it. Do you know why programmers can't tell the difference between Halloween and Christmas? Because oct three one is the same as octal, which is base eight three one is the same as decimal twenty five. I guess you had to be there. Okay, As I told you it was a pretty geeky joke. So now here's our question: What if we want to take something that is in base eight and convert it to base ten? So let's say I have in base eight, oh, I'll have a two, two, six, four, there we go. Um, let, me, let me check what I've got here. Yeah, we're taking a, a, okay, I'm sorry, we're taking a decimal and we're converting it to base eight. So let's take something easier like 25. If we take 25 mod 8, that's going to give us a 1, correct? Now what we're, okay, let's, let's do this with, oh, um, am I sharing my screen? Okay, good, I'm still, sorry, sorry, I just had to make sure I was do, doing the right thing here. I better do this because I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to show up properly. Okay. Um, What I could do if I needed to split this up into the individual digits, I'd take mod 10, which gave me a seven, and then I'd divide by 10, which gives me this part, 
Then I take mod 10 of what's left, which gives me a five, and then divide by 10 again, take mod 10, divide by 10, and eventually I get a zero. And there would be my three numbers, three, five, and seven. I'd split them apart that way. Okay. So now let's take, let's say five, 56, well, 56 is not gonna be much of a, um, what's a good number that I should choose? Well, let's take 47. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it mod eight. And that comes out to be a seven. Okay, because 47 divided by eight is five with a remainder of seven. Now I take 47 and divide it by eight, which gives me a five, correct? Now I take five mod eight, which gives me um, five. <laughs> and then I divide by eight and that gives me a zero, which means I've done it. So 47 in mod in, in decimal comes out to five seven in mod in base um in base eight. But notice I did the seven first. Okay, the, 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 the last digit came first, and the this digit came last. So they're in the reverse order that I want them. Yes. And that's what I can use a stack for. I can take these digits, put them on a stack, and then reverse the stack and take them off in the order that I really want them. Like 357, I had seven, then the five, then the three. Pull them off in reverse order, and that gives me three comes first, then five, then seven. And a stack is great for doing that because we have something that we need to remember things and then pull them off in the reverse order that they entered. And here this is. So we can now take a decimal number and give, convert to any base we want from two to 16. And here are our digits. 0 through 9, and because we're going to have 16 possible digits, because we don't have 16 fingers, we need symbols for them, so we'll use A, B, C, D, E, and F to stand for 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. How many of you have used base 16 before, by the way? Yeah. You'll find it coming. How many of you have done HTML before to write web pages? Have you ever done colors? No. Okay. In, uh, when you do things in HTML, you can set colors on here. For example, number sign um, FF0080, that's in base 16. And every two digits tells you how much red, green, and blue there are. So for red, I have 255, no green, and 80 is 128. So that tells me the proportion of red, green, and blue. So if you've ever seen something like this, when you're looking at colors in a web page, that's what they're doing. They're using base 16 to tell you um, what the values are instead of having to use decimal. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, we're going to create a digit stack which is a stack of integers. And then as long as our decimal number is greater than zero, we'll push the mod and then divide. In fact, let me get put some debug output in here. Uh, And then, as long as the digit stack is not empty, I'll get one digit at a time. And then I'll take my result string and add on whatever digit number it was by adding on that substring. So for example, if the digit was six, 
I'd go to zero, one, two, two, three, four, five, six. I'd take this substring here, which is the actual character six, and add that onto my string. So here I'm converting base 30 to base two, then 30 to base eight, which is three, six. By the way, we do not ever read this as 36. You read it as the individual digits, three, six. And when I'm converting it to six, 30 to base 16, I read it as one E. So even if I had a base 16 number that came out to, let's say, three, seven, I would not read it as 37. It's three, seven to make sure that we don't understand that it's not a decimal number. Damn it. And you'll notice here's my bottom of the stack is zero and then four ones. And I'm pulling them off in the reverse order. Here, the st I stack the six first, then the three, and I pull them off in reverse order. 14 and one, which comes out to one E. So a stack makes this very convenient to convert numbers from decimal to some other base. Yeah, I may spill over a little bit into the lab time here. Sorry about that. My timing is not quite as good as I thought it was. Okay. So here, when we have something like A plus B times C, okay, we know that we don't do it from left to right order. We do the, the because multiplication is more important than addition, the multiplication happens first. Okay. Now, the question is, is there some way that we could represent an expression without needing to know the priority that would have it baked in so that everything would work in the correct way? So we wouldn't have to worry about these precedence level, which operators have more priority than the others. Okay. And one way that we can do it is if I fully parenthesize everything, that shows me that the D the multiplication happens first because it's the innermost. Then comes this addition, and then comes that addition. So now once everything is fully parenthesized, that takes care of the priority because the priority is shown by how deeply the parentheses are nested. Now, the problem then that we have is, okay, we got a lot of these damn parentheses and people don't like having too many parentheses. So what we could do is we could move the operator before the operands. So instead of A plus B, we would say plus AB. Okay, or we could say AB plus, and these look really weird as the book says. Okay. So let me write some terms here that we're gonna, so in fix, we have operand, operator, and operand, such as yeah, th uh, three. Post fix is we have the operand, the operand, and then the operator. We'd have three, four plus. And then uh, for prefix, we have the operator first, and then the two operands. So we plus three, four. And you would say, well, why? The, the, everybody's familiar with this one because that's the one we've been used to. Turns out that if you do things in postfix, then you can discard all this business with the parentheses and the priority because the order in which things appear makes it all work out fine. And, and here's how you, the, what they say to do is. When you have things, in, you take everything in parentheses, then move the operator out past the operands. And this plus works on A and this whole thing. So the plus goes all the way out to there. Then you can get rid of the um, 
operators, the, the parentheses. In fact, let me stop sharing here for a second. Let's try this here. Have. So that means I'm going to have, I'm going to move this out to here, which gives me A plus B, C times. Then the plus is going to move out to there. So we'll have A, B, C times plus. And that's our postfix way of doing it. So I'm going to have A, B, and C. I'm going to do the multiplication first, and then I'll do the addition. And in fact, this is the way we're going to evaluate it. So let's say I have 2, 3, 7 times plus. I have the 2, 3, and 7. The times will multiply these two together, which gives me 21. Then I take my plus from the 2 and 21, and that gives me 23. Now, it turns out that this is what's called also reverse Polish notation, mostly because the guy who came up with prefix notation was a Polish guy named Jan Lukaszewicz. And so this is reverse Polish notation because the operand is coming last. And you say, well, who the heck is ever going to use it? The answer is HP calculators used to use reverse Polish notation. So when you did things on a um, HP calculator, you had to learn how to do, the, how to tur turn your expressions inside out, so to speak, to make it all work. And it worked really well, by the way. And here's a more complicated expression where they fully parenthesize it and then move either the operator before the operands or after the operands. Now, the question is, what happens if we want to have a general infix expression? Like, for example, uh, I don't know. where it's not fully parenthesized, or even worse, if I just say three plus seven times two. So the question is, how do I convert that into um, postfix? I'm gonna be using postfix because that's what the book is using most of the time. And here is the algorithm. I'm not going to derive a proof for it, believe me. Okay? I'm going to get each item, which is called a token. I'm going to have an operator stack for keeping my operators and an empty list for the output. So I'm going to scan the token list from left to right. If I have an operand, I append it to the end of the output list. If it's a left parenthesis, I'll push it on the stack. If it's a right parenthesis, I'll pop everything until I get the left parenthesis. And if it's an operator like an arithmetic operator, I'll push it on the operand stack. But first, I have to make sure that I take get rid of everything that is at a higher press or equal priority. So let's go and uh, let's see if I can do this here. Let's move this over to here. Yeah. So the token is an operand. I'll append it to. My next token is a plus. So now I'm going to have a stack here. My stack now has a plus on it. OK, it's not a left parenthesis. It's not a right parenthesis. Um, but it is an operator. I'm pushing on the operator stack. Great. Now my next stack is an operand. I push it onto my list of what's going to go into the output. Okay. Now I have a star. And I'm going to push it on the stack, but first I got to check: is star higher priority than uh, okay? Well, since the plus is lower priority, I'm not going to get rid of the plus. I'm not going to do it yet. Instead, I'm going to just add that there. Now I have an operand. It goes in there. 
Now I have the slash, okay? Slash and star are of equal priority. That means I have to get rid of the star and put it into my output. Now it's okay to push the slash. My last operand is a five. I'm done with my tokens. And now the question is, is there anything left in the stack? Yes, I have to do the division first and then the plus. I pop them in the reverse order. And when I want to evaluate that, I'm gonna multiply the seven and the two first. Then I'm going to divide by five. Oops. Then I'm gonna divide by five. And the last thing that's gonna happen is adding the three, which is exactly what I want to do. And uh, where was it here? Convert to postfix, there we go. So this is, um, I, I rewrote the one in the book so that I could, and this is gonna be using symbols instead of numbers. So if I say A plus B, to, uh, let's, let's say, in fact, let's do this, A plus B times C comes out to A and B get added first, and then I multiply by C. But if I say A plus B times C, then I do the multiplication first, followed by the addition. Let's see if I do some of that. The division is the first thing that happens, followed by the subtraction followed by this multiplication, and the addition happens last. Pretty nice, isn't it? And again, the stack makes this all possible because it remembers the operation and pops them off in the reverse order. Once you take priority into account when you create your stack. Okay, great. Now the question is what would happen if I had numbers there, like I had up there on the board, uh, which I of course erased. If I had this postfix expression, now how am I going to evaluate that is the question. So let's say I have a postfix expression and I'll, I'll switch over to the video in a moment here. So I have three, seven, two, uh, times five slash plus. Excellent. And the answer is a stack is gonna to come to our rescue again. Every time I get an operand, I'm gonna put it on a stack of operands. The three gets pushed, then the seven gets pushed, then the two gets pushed. Now I have a times. That will multiply the first two objects on the stack. I take the two and the seven, multiply them, and I get a 14. Now I take um, the five, and then I do a division. 14 divided by five, since we're using integers, is gonna come out to two. So I pop the five and the 14, I get a two. Now I have a plus, and there's only two things left, the two and the three, and I add them, and what's left on the stack is my result. So once things are in postfix, I can use a stack really easily because I don't have to worry about Okay, well, is addition more important than multiplication? Is multiplication more important than addition? That's all been taken care of by the order in which things occur. And since we're running short on time here, I'm going to upload this later, okay? Um, here is the postfix evaluator. So if you give me, and by the way, the, what they were using, they were using split with blank. In the book, they were getting the tokens. So that in your tokens, you'd have to put a blank before and after every single item. 
I've written it this way using something called tokenize so that it will put all the digits together and the operators. So it'll split a string into an array of tokens so I could have numbers that are you know, more than one digit. So you may want to look at this code. This code is, is not the important part. I'm going to tell you that. This is just to do something better than split. This is the part that's important. Okay. I have a postfix expression. And I'm going to tokenize it. Whether I use split or some other weird method that I wrote up there, that's that's the important is I've got a bunch of tokens. And I'll print out what my tokens are just so I can see them. And then for each token, I'll get rid of any leading and trailing blanks and print it out. If it's the empty string, if it's not the empty string, then I don't know why I put that in there. That was weird. Okay. I'm going to check to see if it begins with a digit. If it begins with a digit, it's a number. So that means I'm going to put it onto my operand stack. Okay, because then I'm going to have an operand stack of integers. Otherwise, it must be an operator. So I'll take my first two operands and I'll pop them off. And then I'll do the math with whatever that operator was and those two operands and whatever that came back to, I'll push that on as the result. And when I'm done with all of that, I'll just get rid of, tell you whatever's on top of the stack because that's our answer. And here's what do math does. You give it an operator and two operands and depending on whether it's a multiplication, division, addition, or subtraction, it returns the right thing for you. So if I went to 7, 18 plus 3, 2 plus divide, and that comes out to 5 when you're done. I should make this look a little bit nicer. Uh, oh, great. Fine. <laughs> like, luckily, I can look at things without removing them. I'm, boy, I'm glad that that operator is in there. Okay. The result's five. And that's the case, because if I take 7 and 18 and add them, that gives me 25. Then I take 3 and 2 and add them, which gives me a 5. 25 divided by 5 is 5. So I will let you look at that at your leisure. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the assignment for stack. This is a, bit, a little bit complicated. I did do a lab today. I put one together that uses... Um, the last two of these, conversion to postfix and evaluating postfix, it's harder than the assignment. So let's just let's just look at the assignment then. I mean, if you want to do the lab, great. And if you want the solution to the lab, let me know and I will um, send it to you at some point. So you're going to have test stack.java. It will have a method that will merge two stacks into a single stack. And we're going to presume that they're in increasing order from the top, from the bottom on up. And you'll give it two stacks and it'll return a new stack that has them merged together. And you'll also want one that reverses a stack. So given a stack of integers, it'll return the same stack, but everything in the reverse order. And you'll want a make stack method, giving it an array of integers and it'll return a stack with the same objects the first item will be at the bottom of the stack and the last item will be at the top. Then you're going to test to see that it works on two stacks of equal length with no duplicate values, unequal length and no duplicate values, unequal length with duplicate values that are shared between the stacks. So there's a seven in both of these. And one stack that has values and one empty stack. The important part is you can have stacks of unequal length and that's what makes this tricky when you have stacks that aren't the same length. Um, you can modify the input stacks. You can even destroy them if you want to on the merge and reverse. If you want to write it so that it doesn't 
destroy them, you can use the clone instance. So you use this version of stack.java. It has a special method called clone um, that will give you a copy of the stack. So you can you know, basically destroy the copy without hurting the original. Okay, do you want me to, I'll, let me show you really quickly what this merge thing looks like. Okay. So let's put in two stacks here. I'll make them the same. Oh, okay. So I'll say I have 10, 14, 26, 48. And my other stack is going to be, let's say, five, uh, 12, 37. Okay. Now, how would you do this by hand? Okay. Well, first thing you do is you look at the top of both stacks. Which one's the winner? 54 is the winner. So I'm going to put that in the new stack. Here's my new stack here, which has 54 in it. Get rid of that. Now I look at the top of the two stacks. Which one's the winner? Uh, well, whichever one I want, I'll use this one as the winner. 48 goes in there. I pop it off. Now I'm comparing the tops of the stacks, right? 48 and 26. Who's the winner? 48 is bigger. Okay, cool. So that means 48 goes here. Compare the top of the stacks. 37 wins. 37 goes in there. Compare 26 and 12, 26 is the winner. 14 and 12, uh, 14 is the winner. 12 versus 10, 12 is the winner. 10 against five, 10 is the winner. <laughs> now I have one thing left in this stack and it goes in there. Now, when I merge them, I still want the smallest number to be at the bottom, correct? Well, I'll just reverse the stack. So I'll take this stack and do a reverse on it, which gives me 5, 10, 12, 14, 26, 37, 48, 48, and 54. And that's what I'm going to return for merge. Okay. You'll want to draw a diagram like this. You want to actually do this. If you don't want to, if you don't have a whiteboard, use index cards that have numbers written on them and make you know, a vertical stack of that. Don't, don't stack them on top of each other, but stack them up so you can play with it and see what happens. What happens if the, um, the I run out? What happens, for example, if I have three things in one stack and none in the other? What do I do then? Well, when you're playing with it in terms of physical cards or doing it on a whiteboard, you just know what to do. And as you do what you know how to do, you, well, you know, I have to do X, Y, and Z. Ask yourself, how did I know to do X, Y, and Z? And how do I translate that into Java? So I strongly recommend, that is my, I would always tell people, my parents would always tell me, do I have to draw you a diagram? The answer is yes, yes, you do have to draw me a diagram because when I see it and physically play with the elements of the diagram, I finally understand what's really going on. So I strongly recommend that you do some of these by hand. And as you do it, do the introspections. Wait a minute, how did I know that I should do this? And then write down how you knew and say, okay, now how do I say that in Java? I think that might make your task a little bit easier to do this. Okay, so avoid. I, I ran way over time here. I'm very sorry about that. So let me stop the recording.